I'm attorney Martin Nicholson from the law office of Martin Nicholson, also known as the Battery Man, for my focus on criminal battery cases. And today, I'm glad to be back. It's been a while. It took a little bit of a break because of work and then also vacation, the holidays. But I'm back and I'm going to continue to produce content, at least I would like to do weekly, so you can stay abreast of things that hopefully you find interesting and things I find interesting about some of the legal cases that are going on. Today I'm going to talk about Johnny G. Good. Yes, Johnny G. Good. Jonathan Majors, and the G is for Grace Jabari, and then the Good is for Megan Good, his current girlfriend. So, as most people know, Jonathan Majors did give an interview to ABC News, which coincidentally is owned by Disney, which does the Marvel movies, Marvel Cinematic Universe, MCU. One of the things that I noticed about this interview is it seemed that this was his attempt to try to make a comeback into Hollywood. The problem I see with this is it's too soon. Not too soon to try to come back to Hollywood, but the interview from a legal standpoint is too soon. And the reason why I say it's too soon is because he has not been sentenced yet. The court has not sentenced him to whatever sentence they're going to give him for this incident, for what he was convicted of. So now these statements that he made can be used by the prosecutor and also can be used by Grace Jabari if she chooses to testify at a sentencing hearing to say this is showing his utter lack of remorse for what he did. And this is why you need to punish him harder. He has disrespected the jury system by saying that this was based on race and things like that. So he's kind of put a mark on the judicial system. I'm assuming he did this interview with the advice of his attorney, but the advice probably should have been to testify at trial. If he wanted to say these things, the best place for him to have said them really would have been at trial. Now, it's easy to say that he should have testified at trial now because he was found guilty. But looking at some of the things he said, this would have been better if he said it at trial. Like for the most part, he sounded believable. He did say they had a tumultuous relationship. One of the pieces, a couple pieces of evidence didn't come in because of his not testifying. So those injuries, the photographic injuries, no one was there to testify to that, that he had to his arm, that he had to his uh, kind of face. Those were not allowed to be introduced into evidence because he did not take the witness stand. He could have taken the witness stand and then he could have described those injuries and they would have proof of those injuries by showing the pictures. So looking back now, hindsight's always twenty twenty, as my dad used to say, he should have probably testified if this is the kind of stuff he was going to say on the witness stand. He explained how those items got on the floor. He said he lost his temper and just knocked them on the floor. He didn't throw them. And when you look at the picture, it does look like they were just knocking on the floor. It doesn't look like someone was throwing all that stuff, right? That was something that wasn't said. So there are things he could have said that would have explained some of this. He wasn't able to explain how she got her injuries, obviously, because most people that I've talked to, when it comes for alternate explanation about how she got those injuries, think maybe that she was drunk, she hit her head when she was at the club and maybe fell down and broke her finger when she was in the closet drunk. Well, another thing that is problematic with this interview is he never really explained the whole entire, con at least the interview I saw, he never explained the whole entire context of those text messages. So you could see where if he got on the witness stand and explained those text messages, that maybe it would kind of leave him a little bit exposed to some kind of harsh cross-examination. He also talked about him thinking about committing suicide. 
So that really didn't come out, but it could have been explored. Maybe that'd make him a little bit more sympathetic. Who knows? But there's definitely things that Jonathan Majors could have testified to at trial that could have maybe helped his case. Also, Grace Jabari. So one of the questions that he asked was about if someone was white, do you think they would have been convicted? And he said, I'll do you one further. What about if this was a black man chasing a white woman down the streets of New York like that? He would have been shot. Well, that is a very interesting contrast that I've heard people say. Yes, reverse it. Here's a man chasing a woman down the street. People are going to think, hey, what's he doing? She's trying to get away from him. So in that particular case, I think it would have been more about the idea of the different way the sexes are treated. If a man's chasing a woman and if a woman is chasing a man. As a matter of fact, if a woman is chasing a man, people are going to most likely think, what did that man do to the woman to get her to chase him? But if a woman is running away from a man, it's like that man is trying to harm that woman. So you also have the issue of how the different sexes are treated in this particular case and in that analogy that he gave. There's also the mention of him saying, hey, Coretta Scott King, Michelle Obama. Well, that is why I'm wearing this shirt. The National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, Tennessee. The Lorraine Hotel. The place where Martin Luther King was assassinated. Well, look at it from this point of view. As he tried to explain, he was using these as an example. And he was also, which was kind of new, which I didn't catch before, was him saying that he was using this as an example of men he wanted to be like, like a Martin Luther King, like a Barack Obama, and then that she should kind of elevate herself to that standard. Although the clip that they showed in the interview, I didn't feel like he went deep enough into her issues, such as I was using these women as the character of how people should conduct themselves as an example, a template, regardless of race, to say, look at the character of these women and model yourself in the character of these strong women, regardless of race. I didn't feel like he really went deep enough to say that, but given him the benefit of the doubt, I feel like that is another example that he is trying to say. Like, look, it is great that someone who is African-American can be emulated in the sense of their character. Now, obviously, African-American women have a different struggle and a different challenge than somebody that's a white female. But similar to someone that is in a sport that says, hey, I want to be like Mike Tyson, even though they're white or they're Latino, or they're Chinese, but it doesn't make any difference. They're talking about the part of his profession in the ring that they want to emulate. The character of someone like Michelle Obama or Coretta Scott King, all people should want to strive to be good, strive to be honest, to want to be healthy, to help others. This is basically the character of the women that he's describing she should be like. And also, as far as we know, not be involved in uh, drugs, not be involved in going out and getting totally wasted and basically embarrassing yourself. This is the type of activity that I would hope he was trying to say. But on the flip side, yes, there's a lot of people that are totally upset by this because he's like, hey, if you wanted to get someone that is African-American to be like African-American should have been dating African-American woman, which brings us to Megan Good. Megan Good, African-American female, that he says that, you know, he's really glad that she's supporting him through this and they have a really good relationship. Obviously, she's probably trying to help him, hopefully trying to help him through whatever it is he's going through. Now, listen, I am someone that believes in Love who you love regardless. The world is too big 
and time is too short on this earth that you should limit yourself by putting out some kind of artificial barrier that says just because someone is a different ethnicity doesn't mean I cannot date them or love them or marry them. Life's too short for that. I really believe that everyone is human and people have their preferences. Whether you like tall people, short people, people with long hair, people bald-headed, beards, no beard, people have preferences of the things that they like and they should enjoy them. I think that the issue of race, in this case, fell flat. Not that it didn't exist, because it did, but the way it was portrayed during the trial fell flat. Because she was dating an African-American man, there was no issue or there was no evidence that she was any kind of racist or anything like that. And the prosecutor was black, and then majority of the jurors are were white. So I think that issue kind of fell flat. It would have, I think, would have been a stronger argument, and I still think that, if the argument was really raised regarding the issue of self-defense, defense of property, because in his interview, he said she grabbed for his phone and he held on to it. So their argument could have been made. It was his phone. She had no business grabbing it. And if she did get hurt along the way, it was her own fault for grabbing his phone because he had a right to defend himself. Obviously, I didn't have access to all the information. I didn't have one-on-one -on -one attorney client conversations with Jonathan Majors to know what other things could be exposed that would harm his case. But just from an outsider and watching, it seems like the defense could have been a little bit stronger in, in the sense of a defense of property, defense of self, that's why he was running type of thing. Well, obviously, that's not the way they went. They went a different way and got the result that they got. Jonathan G. Good. Jonathan G. Good. For people that know music, like rock music, you can think of Johnny Be Good by Chuck Berry and also done again by the legendary Jimi Hendrix. Johnny Be Good, in this case we're talking about Jonathan G. Good. The reason why this is important for him to be good, G. Good, is because he's going to be sentenced next month. And the court can look at all these statements, what he's doing since he was convicted to use that as an aggravator or a mitigator. Now, he mentioned that he's you know, taking medicine for some of the issues, the mental health issues he has. Hopefully, he's getting the help that he needs, and this can come out during his sentencing. So maybe that will mitigate his sentence where he won't be sentenced as harshly. But he has to be careful about what statements he makes publicly because they can come back and use those. Hey, now you're making a statement when you had the opportunity to say it in court when it could have counted. And I know his defense is, well, everything I was going to say, someone else said. But that is not exactly accurate because he could have said in more detail that I had the phone and she tried to grab it from me. He could have said, she hit me, she slapped me, she scratched me, and here is the evidence of that. Could have said that. He could have gave what was going on inside of his mind, the things that people that are outsiders could not say. So I think there was some information that he could provide, but it could have backfired if there's other stuff out there that they did not want to come in. And we don't know really what that is. So at the end of the day, Jonathan's interview, I don't think necessarily really helped his public image that much, and it could hurt him a little bit at sentencing. But I'm not sure that the way he probably intended this to come off came off the way he intended. Similar to in the very beginning when his attorneys were saying, hey, we have video and documents that's going to exonerate him and and all this kind of stuff like that. And then they started letting it out. And then it really didn't do what they said it was going to do. Here's another example, I think, where if he has a PR firm or whoever's giving him this advice, 
I don't think it's the best advice. Now, I put a caveat on that by saying I am not some PR firm and I don't have a lot of experience you know, in Hollywood or how things work. I'm just saying from the average person's view that's watching this, I don't think it really swayed anybody to a side that was, really was not on his side already. And it's evidence, statements that can be used against him in court to say that he's not really remorseful. He's basically disrespecting the jury verdict. And he doesn't have to be remorseful. If his position is, I didn't do anything wrong, what am I going to be remorseful about? I understand that, and that's happened in cases I've had. But he really has to be careful about is the issue of the jury's verdict and not being disrespectful to that or the judicial system at this particular time because he hasn't been sentenced yet. And after he gets sentenced, you know, he can say whatever he wants to say because at the end of the day, he didn't testify at trial. So the statements he's making now are really only to try to make his image look better. And he could wait another month to get that part after he gets sentenced and say, hey, now I know what my sentence is. Now I can go ahead and say what I've been wanting to say. And the reason why I didn't say anything, because I wanted to wait until I got sentenced. That's your Nicholson Nugget of the Day. Please make sure to like and subscribe.